Luke chapter 5 and verse 27, we'll read to the end of the chapter this morning. After this, he, that is Jesus, went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth. He said to him, follow me. And leaving everything, he rose and followed him. And Levi made him a great feast in his house. And there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at the table with him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And they said to him, the disciples of John fast often and offer prayers, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees, but yours eat and drink. And Jesus said to them, can you make the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. He also told them a parable. No one tears a piece from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. If he does, he will tear the new and the piece from the new will not match the old. No one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins, and it will be spilled, and the skins will be destroyed. But new wine must be put into fresh wineskins. And no one, after drinking old wine, desires new, for he says, the old is good. Thus the reading of God's holy word. You may be seated work on their horror of the same old thing. That was the advice that was given by the senior devil, Uncle Screwtape, to his younger nephew, Wormwood, on how to steer people away from the Christian faith in C.S. Lewis' novel, The Screwtape Letters. Work on their horror of the same old thing. Make them think that it is tedious, that it's boring, that it's monotonous, that there's nothing exciting and the more boring the better. And therefore they will look elsewhere, preferably to the world that seems so enticing and so enchanting, where everything seems novel and new, where excitement is contained. And therefore, in contrast, Christianity will look ancient and old and therefore have nothing to offer. Well, the devil's schemes are hard at work and they are working well in our day and age. One author writes about this phrase from C.S. Lewis' book, this, social media in our day and age thrives off of people's fear of the same old thing. And thus, we strive to make our lives seem epic and awesome and not ordinary. We feel compelled to maintain the myth and to keep up the image. So we make sure that people see that we're always having fun, that we're going cool places, that we're hanging with cool friends, anything as long as it's not the same old thing. Well, the conclusion from all of that might be, that's right, fun is bad and you shouldn't have fun. That the devil is in all that delights. But that would be an equally wrong conclusion. And even more so, from our passage this morning, we would say that's a false truth. That too is a lie from Satan himself. Christianity and Christ are the source of true, unadulterated joy. The joy and happiness and laughter are not bad things. In fact, they are good things. They are God-given things. They are God-given delights. And therefore, if your definition of Christianity is that it ought to be austere and stoic, and that you must always have a perpetually pouty face, then you do not know the Christ of the Bible. And perhaps you do not truly understand the salvation in such a savior. Because such a thought is more akin to the belief of the Pharisees, as we'll see this morning, than to Jesus. 
Because what we see is that our calling and our salvation in Christ ought to be the chief celebration of our life. The source of unfading joy and delights. We'll see that this morning in three points. The calling of the outcast, the dining with detestables, and then celebrating with joy. First, the calling of the outcast. We see this morning a calling of a new disciple, that of Levi or Matthew as he's called. Even though we do not have the specific callings of all of the disciples, the gospel writers, Luke included, thought it was significant to write of the calling of Levi. And that was because it was out of the ordinary, meaning that it caused a scene, it caused a stir, a scandal even. Why was that? Because Levi was a tax collector. We understand that to some degree. No one likes the tax man, especially as April 15th comes upon us. But I think that we would at least say, well, that's a noble profession. But that was not the case in Levi's situation. It was not a noble profession, and it was not an honest profession. To be a tax collector and First century Judaism was to be a traitor. Remember that at this time, Jerusalem and Judea and Galilee were all in Roman occupation. It was Roman occupied territory. And so therefore the collecting of taxes was not for Israel, but for Rome, the occupier. In essence, it was funding the enemy. It was to continue the occupation. And what made it worse was that Levi was not a Roman. He was not one of them, but rather he was one of them, that is, the Jews, as was indicated by his name. He was Jewish born and bred, as we would say. But he had now essentially turned his back upon his own people. And for what? Well, all for profit. That's what it was. Rome would essentially allow these individuals to buy tax franchises, to essentially establish a partnership with the Roman government that you would collect so much money for them and then you could keep the rest. And therefore, not only was it funding the occupation, it was actually quite a profitable endeavor. And so we would have to conclude that gain and greed would be the only reason to go into this. It was not surely to win friends and to influence people. And so Levi was a traitor. He was a weasel. And even worse, he was a rich weasel. Taking it off the backs of his own people, oftentimes by brute force. And so to say that there was no loss, uh, loss of love by the Jewish people for tax collectors would be a gross understatement. Their scorn, their contempt, their hatred for tax collectors would be palpable. They were seen on the same social scale as harlots and prostitutes, and I would guess that prostitutes probably had the slight edge on them. They were the bottom of the bottom in Jewish society. So much so that they could not function as witnesses in a trial because their testimony was considered not trustworthy. They were forbidden from entering into their local synagogue. They were essentially excommunicated from the Jewish religion because of their profession. No one wanted to see them or have anything to do with them. That is, all but Jesus. As we have already seen with the calling of Peter and fishermen, Jesus did not call upon the elite, the upper crusties of society, those that were the most spiritual 
or those that were most economically rich. But this calling, the calling of Levi in essence, calling of a tax collector, is a new level of low. You might ask, how low could you go? Well, this was rock bottom, according to the Jews. So much so that you might wonder, did Jesus not know? Was he kind of under a rock there in Nazareth that he doesn't really understand Jewish society and how tax collectors were seen, what they were collecting tax for? No, Jesus surely did know. In fact, if you look at our passage, we see that he was fully aware. Why was that? Well, look at verse 27. After this, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth. Levi, when he was called, was engaged in the very act of collecting tax. He was, in a sense, doing that which he was already doing. We would say that he was doing that which we would call having his hand stuck in the cookie jar when Jesus calls him. And notice what Jesus responds to him while he's engaged in this act of what we would deem treachery. Jesus says to him, follow me. Now you might think Jesus would say, follow me as I take you to the other side of the woodshed and teach you a thing or two about what it means to be loyal to your own. But that's not what he calls him to. He calls him to follow me, to be a disciple of mine, to be a part of my inner circle, one of my 12 disciples, yes, even one of my friends. I know this is a familiar story to us, but we ought to be astounded by the radical nature of this call, of this relationship, of this friendship. Jesus was befriending the likes of a Levi. Now we've already seen Jesus doing that which we would think was unfathomable when he touches the leper. But even in that case, we would say, well, this leprosy that this leper had was no fault of his own. But this, this in Levi's case, was, was willful and intentional. It was purposeful back-turning. And we might say that, Jesus, you should leave him there. He has, he has acted in such a way that he should, he should experience the consequences of his actions. We would say he is getting what is coming to him. But yet, Jesus doesn't think like us. He rather says, come to me. He says, follow me. And therefore, Levi ought to be the patron saint, the radical example that no one has ever gone too far. That they are too far lost. That they are untouchable. That they are unsavable. No one, as long as they have breath in their lungs, are out of the reach of the Lord Jesus Christ, even if they have acted willfully. And this ought to be a great encouragement for us. This should be a great encouragement to you if you have a prodigal son or a prodigal daughter or grandson or granddaughter or family member. Those people that we go, I don't know if... if if they can truly be saved, they might be a little too lost. No, that is never the case. If God can save and call a pariah like Levi, then he can call and save anyone. That is the lesson of this calling, and it should give us great encouragement to continue to pray and continue to speak to our friends and our co-workers and our family about Christ. Because you never know when he may supernaturally call one of them unto himself. When he gives them those same life-saving words, that life-giving command of follow me. And they follow him into newness of life. 
And so whenever you get discouraged, which we all get discouraged, don't we? We need to remember Levi. And we should say, Lord, if you could do it with him, then you can do it again. And so please, Lord, do it again. Save another sinner out of his sin. Straight out of the tax booth, we would say. Straight out of the clutches of the devil and hell itself into everlasting life of following Christ. That's the work of our Savior, isn't it? And not only has he done it, he continues to do it. And so let us not forget. Let us instead be astounded of this calling. And perhaps as we look at this and and say, you know, this is too much. Jesus has gone too far. Well, we see him go even farther. And we see him not only calling, but dining. And not only dining with Levi, but dining with what we would call detestables of that culture. And notice when he is called, what happens? It says that he left everything, arose, and followed him. Notice the cost of discipleship, leaving this tax booth, leaving this vocation as a tax collector would have been very costly to him, but he saw a greater reward in following Christ than what he could gain in this world. And notice what his first act of discipleship, of his followership was, was to have a feast for Jesus. Now notice this was not Levi just happened to have a a feast planned and therefore invited Jesus to it. Notice what verse 29 says. And Levi made him a great feast in his house. Jesus was the reason for the feast or what we might call a party. Again, we might ask, is this appropriate And what I would say to you is, yes, most definitely. Doesn't Jesus frown upon this? No, he not only frowns upon it, he attends it. And it was a great feast. A great feast with good food and and good drink. In the words of our, our good friend Dale Ralph Davis in his commentary, he says this was no mere chip and dip affair. This was first class, top drawer entertainments. Remember, Jesus was was called a a glutton and a drunk by the Pharisees. Was he either of those things? No, absolutely not. But that was the association with where Jesus was at. Those that he associated with. Those that knew how to have a good time with food and with drink. And that is the place where Jesus goes. He goes to Levi's house. And once again, it demonstrates the level of association that Jesus was willing to have. Levi was not just a mere token tax collector to be a part of his group, a part of his entourage, and to be kind of treated as a a second-class citizen, a, a lower than, someone to be around but not near. No, what we read... Jesus says to his disciples in John 15, 15, I do not call you servants, but friends. Jesus called Levi a friend. And we see the level of friendship that he was willing to have. He goes to his home. Now he's fully aware of who was inviting him and also who would attend such a feast. And we see who was there. Luke tells us there was a large company. This is a a great feast with with lots of people. And those people were, as it says, tax collectors and and others. And that's probably a proper designation. That they were tax collectors and what we would call others. The thems of society. Others that were not included. Those that were outsiders, those that were considered despicable and detestable. The Pharisees called them sinners. And why was it that these people attend this party? Well, it would be the only ones that Levi knew in the first place. And it was also the only ones that would associate with him. That would dare to show up to the house of a tax collector. 
Another, this was the misfits, the outcasts of society. And yet, don't miss this. Why did Jesus, or why did Levi put on this feast for Jesus? So that his friends could also meet the same one that he had met. That that which had happened to him would happen to them. That what he had found in Jesus, he would now want to share with others, those closest to him. And he does it in the context of a feast. Now, did he have to have food? Did he have to have drink? But no, but sure doesn't hurt, does it? As we say in the South, we, people got to eat. <laughs> and they got to drink. And he might as well do it together. And therefore, we should think of this as his first act of discipleship, of followership, is, was hospitality. And we should never underestimate our homes as a base operation for our ministry. Yes, we should go to the ends of the earth, but don't forget the very place that you live. And therefore, we should not have too high a view of our house, thinking my home is, is my sanctuary, the place where I retreat, and therefore I don't want it to get dirty. I don't want things to break. We need to remember that our homes are not our own, are they? They're the Lord's. Therefore, we want to use all things for, for his glory, for him, as Levi was doing. Likewise, we don't want to have too low a view of our homes either, thinking who would want to come to my place? It's nothing. It's, it's not nice enough to have people over. It's sure not as nice as the, the Joneses up the street. And I don't have china and, and real silverware to host people. That's fine. Put out some plastic plates and cups. They'll do. If Jesus could use a home like Levi, then he can surely use yours and mine just fine. Because the point of hospitality is not the house, is it? Nor the food, nor the drink, or us. It's Jesus. The point of hospitality is to have our guests experience Christ. Not to see how great we are, but to see how great He is. And that's what truly happened that day in Levi's home as it does in our own. And therefore, let us be a, a friendly and hospitable church. Not only around the tables of our church here in this place, and as you've probably already noticed, we, we like to, to eat around here and we like to gather around tables. That's intentional. But have that hospitality extend upon these walls to the tables and couches of your home as well. Inviting others in. Because we should see church as the base camp for kingdom ministry. But you should see your home and your work as outposts of the kingdom. Spread throughout Atlanta and beyond Places that, that SPC and, and, can I say it, that the pastors of SPC can, can never reach, but the people of SPC can. And as long as we work and minister and open up our homes, the Lord will do a great thing. He will, he will come and, and be in that place. And that is what is most important, isn't it? And that's what we see here is that not only was Jesus invited in, but he enters in and even enters in. He wasn't off in the corner. He's there reclining at the table with them. There's a childhood prayer that perhaps you were taught that prays this as you gather around the table. Come, Lord Jesus, be our guest. And let thy gifts to us be blessed. Amen. But it is that phrase, isn't it? Come, Lord Jesus, be our guest. In our place, at our home, at our tables. That is indeed what Levi was engaged in that day. Well, there are few that that day that did not like what he was doing and the Pharisees and scribes had seen enough and they begin to object and we see in 
verse 30, that they begin to, to grumble and complain to the disciples, and they ask, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? You hear what they are implying and what they are saying by their question. Jesus, if you are, are so great, if you're truly a, the Messiah or even a good rabbi, then you would not be spending time with the likes of them. If you knew truly who they are and who they were. And the flip side of that question is, if you are so great, why are you not spending more time with us? It's a very much an us versus them scenario, isn't it? And does that still happen today? Of course it does. It doesn't take much to easily come up with the, the thems of society. Sinfully so. But notice how Jesus looks at things. He does not play their game nor ours. He sets up a very different one. Look at his response to them in verse 31. Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Notice he doesn't set it up us versus them. Rather, he sets it up as well versus sick. Righteous versus sinners. And Jesus says, these people, these people that you call sinners, they recognize their need. They recognize that they are not well, that they are indeed sick and that they need something. And therefore they come. And so what Jesus is saying and what he's implying by this question is, do you see your need? How do you see yourself? Do you see yourself as well? Do you see yourself as righteous? Or do you see yourself as sick and as a sinner? And then with that, one of the most profound statements, one of the purpose statements of Christ in the gospel, he says, this is why I have come for the likes of these people, for the likes of sinners. I've come not for the righteous, but for sinners to repentance. Indeed, just as a doctor would be in a doctor office, or a coach would be found in a gym, so Christ as a Savior, would be in the place with sinners. And that is what we must see by this, is that until you see yourself that way, you will never come. As we sang earlier, if you tarry until you're better, you will never come at all. Jesus comes to be with sinners, not with those that seem that they are all right, being seen and known as a sinner is indeed the rock of offense. It's the stone of stumbling in our culture and perhaps even in your own heart. But until you see yourself as this way, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Why? Because we must understand that before a holy God, and not only before a holy God, but having our faces to the ground in the dust before such a holy God that all are greater, that all are better. When you have that view of yourself, then the only thing that you can do is look up. And in looking up, there is everyone that is above you and before you. Why? Because you are the chief of sinners. If the Lord can save me, if he can save my sin-sick soul, then he can save anyone and everyone. Is that how we come? Because that is the only way we come. You cannot think, well, yeah, I have a few problems in life. No, you are sick. You cannot say, well, you know what? Most of the time I do right. No, you are a sinner. I have a few things to offer unto the Lord and things that he may need my help in. No, I am dead in my sins and my transgressions. That's why Jesus is wide is the gate. And broad is the way that leads to destruction, but, but narrow the gate and narrow the path that leads to life and few find it. Have you found it? There's only one door. It's the door for sinners. 
It's the door by which we must enter, and there we will find Jesus the Savior. If you have found it, then you must say about Levi this morning, Levi, the the tax collector, the outcast, the misfit, the despicable, the detestable, he is actually more worthy than I. He is more deserving of salvation than I am. And yet Jesus has befriended me. Just like he befriended Levi, he has saved me because he is gracious and he is a friend of sinners. If that is true of you this morning, then the result ought to be joy. That we would celebrate with joy. And that is why we see in this very next section, this section that follows this calling of Levi in every gospel. And so what we see is that the questions continue by the Pharisees. That they did not take Jesus' question to heart, but rather they continue to question. And in fact, go farther than question. They try to divide the disciples of John and the disciples of Jesus. They try to say the the disciples of John, they pray and they fast, but your disciples do not do that. There was no division between Jesus and John, but they attempt to make one. And so they want to know who's right and and who's wrong. Ultimately, it's to cast dispersion and doubt on Jesus. We know that the Pharisees love to to fast and they love to pray and they ultimately love to see people fast, see them fast and for people to see them pray. I have a friend who's a ruling elder in another church that was formerly a fighter pilot. And he said to me, Joel, you know what fighter pilots love to do more than fly really fast jets? And I said to him, no, I don't. He says, they love to tell people that they fly really fast jets. And that is the same of the Pharisees. What they love to do more than pray and fast is to see and have others see them fasting and praying. And they looked at the disciples of Jesus and said, they are obviously not doing this. They are not taking their faith serious. Not as serious as us and not even as serious as the disciples of John. They're never fasting. They're only eating and drinking. There's no soberness. There's only celebration. And Jesus tells them that's because you have the wrong perspective. He says in verse 34, can you make wedding gas fast while the bridegroom is with them? The wedding guests cannot fast at the wedding. I know it's almost wedding season. Wedding season is upon us. How inappropriate would it be to have a gloomy and funeral-like wedding service and celebration? where everyone wore black and cried tears of sorrow. We would say that does not fit the scene. No, it needs to be a joyous celebration. Love, joy, happiness, and a lifetime of the same. Wedding guests rejoice. They're to eat and drink and be merry. That's what's required. No gloom, no dour, no fasting. Now Jesus, by saying this, is by no means annulling fasting. There's great spiritual benefits to it, but just not at a wedding. And what Jesus is saying is that ought to be the sentiment of Christians and of the Christian life as a whole. Again, not to say that there is never sorrow. Not to say that Christians don't cry or lament or even get depressed, but that is not the overarching outlook of the Christian life. It ought to be one of joy And we're not to be Eeyores, woe is me. We're not to have this perpetual rain cloud above our heads that we bring darkness wherever we go. No, we bring light. The light of the joy of salvation, the light of the joy of our salvation. That is what Jesus is saying here. And he gives two parables. The first of the parables in the Gospel of Luke That no one puts a new piece on an old garment and no one puts new wine in old wineskins. Why? Because it just doesn't work. It doesn't fit. 
The new fabric is not going to look right on the old garments. And likewise, the new wine will stretch and ferment the old wineskins. And therefore, all of the wine will burst on the ground and be wasted. It will be a waste of, of both. And that is what Jesus is saying. I didn't come to patch up old things, but to make all things new. In other words, Christ is not an accessory. He's not an add-on. He's a complete change. He's a complete life change inside and out. As he'll say elsewhere, the yeast doesn't just leaven just a part of the dough, does it? It leavens the whole lump. And that is the nature of life in Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit that we are not the same. We are radically made new and it affects every part. There's nothing that is not touched or goes untouched. From the way that we think, to the way that we speak, to the way that we talk, to the way that we live our lives, to the way that we view the world and view the future, it has all changed in Christ. That's the radical nature of conversion. And it's not hard to spot, is it? It's like comparing a, a caterpillar to a butterfly. We would say that they are the same, but at the same time, they're not. They're so different. That is the conversion in Christ that all things are new. And I would say that one of the chief signs of conversion is joy. That you see it in one's eyes. Because the life of Christ resides there. And therefore, church, we ought to be the joyous of all people. Because we have the greatest reason to rejoice I love what J.C. Ryle says in his commentary on this passage. He says, Levi was right to rejoice. And if we are converted, let us rejoice likewise. Nothing can happen to man which ought to be such an occasion of joy as his conversion. It's far more important than being married or coming of age or being a nobleman or receiving a great fortune. It is the birth of of an immortal soul. It is the rescue of a sinner from hell. It is passage from life to death. It is being made a king and priest forever. It is being provided for, both in time and eternity. It is adoption into the noblest and richest of all families, the family of God. Let us, Ryle says, not heed the opinion of the world. They know not of what they speak. Amen, because there is joy in Christ. That is what is said in our digital sign below the names of Smyrna Presbyterian Church. It says, joy in Christ. And that is what I see in this place. And as your pastor, I want to commend you for it. You all are a lot of fun. And there's a lot of laughing that goes on. Crying too, but more laughing. And I think that's how it ought to be. Where the place where Jesus abides and where he dwells, there's joy. And we're not to be the frozen chosen nor sour-faced stoicism. And we're to have authentic joy in Christ. And so let me ask as we close up this morning, is your heart a place of joy? Not in your circumstances, but in Christ. Did you wake up this morning and were you excited? Did you think, yes, this is the best day of the week where I get to meet with Christ and with his people? Is this a day of joy for you? Is your home a place of joy where you delight in your spouse and your children and your grandchildren? As you thank God that he would give you this gift as the giver of all good gifts and that you would be equally filled with joy. Why? Because he has made us new. He's made all things new. And then just think, this is just the beginning of it. That you ain't seen nothing yet. That the best is yet to come. Or we won't just be the wedding guests. 
But we, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, will be the bride, the bride of Christ. And then we'll gather for another feast, won't we? The wedding feast of the Lamb. And there we'll join in everlasting and eternal joy. My friends, true joy is not found in the world. True joy is found in Christ and Christ alone. Amen. Join me in prayer. Lord, we come this morning confessing that oftentimes that is not our attitude. That if we just had a little bit more money, if we had a promotion, if we had a better house or a better car, or if our kids would do a little bit better in school, then we would be a little bit happier than we are right now. Lord, what foolishness. Our joy, our true happiness does not come in our circumstances, but it comes in Christ alone. And so let us look once again to our salvation and find true joy and delight in the Lord Jesus Christ and Him alone. And from that, may our cup overflow, may our joy overflow to everything that we do, the way that we live, the way that we parent, the way that we live in relation with our spouse, the way that we work, the way that we view our neighbors and even view the world. Lord, would we not make it about us versus them? Would we make it about those that are well or those that think they are well and those that are sick? And Lord, would we see a world that is sick and that is hurting and that is even dying without Christ? And therefore, would we have a heart to go just as you would go in the midst of sinners like this. Lord, we are grateful that you called us out of our sin, out of our willful disobedience to you. Lord, yet you did not say we were too far off, too far gone, that the consequences of our sin were too great for us to be saved. And so, Lord, would we never have that perspective towards others either. But, Lord, would you save? Would you deliver? And would you begin with us? We pray this all in Christ, our Savior's name.